All right, we got it. What's going on, everybody? Hello and welcome to On The Pipe Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Tyler Shepardson, and today is Thursday, June the 15th. 2023 years after zero we got a really fun show coming at you Stu Baylor's joining us live in studio um so as you know we heard from Stu a lot last year this year um we're checking in with him seeing how the year is going we're going to talk to him and and get all up to date with what's going on but first I want to let you guys know Beta Motorcycles is the official manufacturer of On The Pipe Podcast. They are family owned and operated since 1905. They manufacture the finest enduro trials and dual sport motorcycles that are known for their premium quality and rideability. Um, They are best looking bikes on the market and they back it up with their superior performance. Head over to betausa.com for more information on their available models or find a dealer near you to get yours today. On top of that, this is also brought to you in part by Zach Tussle over at Raymond James Financial. Zach Tussle is a good friend of the show. He is a racer, he is a financial advisor, and he helps his clients win when it comes to retirement and financial planning. Um, that confused me. I heard my voice. I heard my voice coming from other other areas, but. Um, so yeah, hit up Zach Tussle, financial advisors, DenverNC.com. He can get you dialed in and up to date with uh, your financial future. And like I said, he's a good buddy of the show, and he's out on the, the starting line with us each weekend racing himself. So without further delay, last year it was a big hit. Weekend's review with Stu. Now we got our very own studio, so Stu is in Stu, and we're going to check, check in with him now. So welcome to the show. Welcome to the to the place now Stu Baylor yeah it's uh good to be back traveling north and we've kind of talked about it you've brought it up like hey if you're ever coming through and I come through a lot it's just never seems to be the right time and I'm really glad that I didn't try to bring my RV and trailer in here we would have shut this entire town down but I mean hey there's I think though I think we could fit it out there I'm like I I don't even want to say how long I am just in case DOT's (laughs) listening (laughs) I would have taken out street signs. You're across. I see the police department. So yeah. Like, yeah, it would have been. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it would have been fun. It would have been interesting, at least. We so, wouldn't have got a podcast in, but we would have got a tow out. Well, <laughs> uh, if DOT is listening, yeah, we're right here off of uh, Interstate 10. So if you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sue's going to be headed west from here. Uh, but no, man, I appreciate you coming out. Appreciate you stopping by. It is pretty conveniently right off the interstate, though. It really is. I passed by here. Like, basically, after we start heading to the Northern Rounds, I pass here every single weekend. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, it, it works out good. And, you know, it may not be a, a, a Tuesday weekend review, but, uh, you know, we've got a lot more to catch up than a weekend. It's been a while since I've been on the podcast. It's been a little hiatus here. Yeah. But, yeah, man, that's why I appreciate you taking some time out. And, obviously, as you can see, as this place looks like a tornado went through it. <laughs> it's been a little bit busy this year for me, too. But speaking of busy – you were jumping Land Rovers and, and stuff the other day. What's going on, man? You're all over the place. Content, man. Content. No, it's, it's uh, king. It, it's one of those things. Like, um, I, I feel like I've put myself out there in ways that a lot of guys haven't, and it, and it creates a lot of unique opportunities. And that happened to be one of those. And this guy is, uh, you know, everybody sees the be your own boss code pop up on Facebook, basic giveaways. Um, you buy a T-shirt, you get entered. So he's doing some giveaways like that. Um, super cool dudes. He's using content for, I guess, his his his, his business model is more towards, like, the whistling diesel style. So let's tear shit up but also give shit away and hope to make some money. Yeah. So I got to be a part of tearing shit up, which was pretty awesome because I'm really good at that. <laughs> like that's uh, There's a lot of things that I'm bad at, but that's, like, one, that's up there. I'm really high on tearing shit up. So – um, no, that was that was just an opportunity that pre- presented itself. It's going to be um, a sponsor. This guy's actually going to come in, set up at uh, at the last GNCC at Ironman. Um, they're bringing a band in. So as of now, um, hopefully, hopefully everything works out. But Friday night, the band that'll be playing um, is going to be brought brought by Devon Performance and. A little bit, little bit of a of a crossover industry. The guy's into performance stuff. He's he's into badass T-shirts, and he's very um, well. Let's just say he's not a liberal. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, his shirt his shirts go with with what we push and what we promote in racing. And 
um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it just happened to be a really cool opportunity. They were like, Hey, we're looking for a place that we can come and destroy something. Would you open the doors to us? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. can you do that at the Shoals? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, that's us seven days a week. Like, where have yeah. you been? We've been doing it for free this whole <laughs> yeah. time. We tear up a dozer on Monday, a skid steer <laughs> on Tuesday, a traco on Wednesday, the water truck on Thursday, and the water lines get ripped out every Friday. Yeah. Come on. So, um, no, it, it was, uh, it, it, it was, it was awesome. Um, we got some rain. So as soon as that thing started up and got off the trailer, I held it to the floor until I didn't think it would go anymore. <laughs> and like, <laughs> let me tell you, the, the wife has wanted, the wife has wanted a Ranger over for a long time. I'm sold. It was impressive. Like the shit we put that car through, like we had to actually try to destroy it. Like it wasn't something that like you could go out and say, I'm going to drive it like a UTV for four hours, and it's just going to fall <laughs> apart. It kept going. Dang. So, no, we were impressed. It was good. Yeah, but see, then you get those things. You go to start it in your driveway one day, and it just doesn't start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, it's a Range Rover? Oh, you got to go to this dealership. Yeah. I, that's what I tried to explain to her. Like, it's a boutique car. Yeah. Like, we can take a – she drives a Chevy. I'm a Ford guy. I know. I should have never bought the thing. But she drives a Chevy, and we can take it anywhere. The Range Rover, like, they're going to go ahead and jack that price up. But – no, I'm sold on it. Uh, yeah. Honestly, it's a very, very good off-road vehicle. Beats Dude. the hell out of anything I've put in the mud. The thing downside <laughs> of the tabletop, way better than I expected. So clean. I was literally waiting for the back end to just, like, come up, and, like, the air ride wasn't working. So the air ride was shot, and we're like, all right, how are we going to jump it? And I'm like, I don't want to jump it. Like, my my back's shot. I've been racing for yeah. way too long. Like, no. Guy's like, I'll throw a pillow under my ass, and I'll hit it. I'm like, all right, good. Who, cool. So who jumped it first? So the owner, it's it's his son. He's uh, a little bit younger than I am, and um, he jumped at first. I was still sitting on the equipment, like making sure the face was good. And then when I got behind the wheel, they all said that I was a chicken shit. Like I, <laughs> it took. I had to warm up a little bit. Like I, I jumped at ten feet, and he was jumping at forty. But he got warm up runs. Like I was still making the face. We got her a good 40 feet, though. Like, I got really close to his to his line. And then it, <laughs> from there, we were like, all right, the air ride sucks. Like, this is bullshit. Like, car's riding terrible at this point. Let's destroy it. We're sitting there. We're building the ramp to launch it into the, into the ravine, which I really thought was going to be more spectacular. Like, I thought it was going to go a little bit higher up the ravine. It didn't. <laughs> but the camera does, as most times, like the camera did no justice on the drop it was. Like that's actually a ravine Johnny Gerard jumped years ago, and nobody else even thinks about it. That's like the same it's one? A, yeah, it's 100 feet. Like, So the car was in air for 80 to 100 feet. It just doesn't look like it on camera. And then smoked the rock wall. But we're sitting there building this ramp, and the air ride starts working. The car just starts lifting up. I'm like, where has this been? We fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> it was from the tabletop. We fixed it. Um, and then we took it to a buddy's used car lot. We called him actually Brad called him and said, Hey, uh, we've got a, <laughs> we've got a car that we're trying to trade in. Uh, it's a, it's a cherry Range Rover. We want the new Denali diesel that you got there. And we timed it out. Like I pulled in it. We've got more content coming, but I pulled in just, <laughs> just before him. He pulls in with this badass Rhino line fire truck. Like, it is the thing looks one sick. of the sickest things I've ever seen. Like, the way they built this thing is unbelievable. And uh, he pulls in with this and this completely totaled Tannerite shot, the roof peeling back, like, just ruined car. And my buddy walks out. It's it's the kid that I usually post on, on the shoals. He, he's my he's the, the golden child over there, Dawson Cobb. So it's his dad. We kept him late from work. Like, Brad was calling him constantly. Like, hey, man, I'm sorry. We're running late. We'll be there. Meanwhile, I've got the track hoe, like, trying to guide this thing into the back <laughs> of the trailer. Like, it was it was bad. So, um, we pull in. We've kept this guy late from work. I pull in just before Brad. They get there, and he goes, uh, uh, that must be Brad. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yep, he goes, oh, shit. I should have known you were involved. I should have known it. But needless to say, they didn't give us fair market value for the car. Dude, it was probably still worth more than a Tesla. 
<laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. In your situation, I would say so. Yeah, I'll, I'll three more still months. Still got so it. You, you guys want to trade straight up, dude? I hey, <laughs> the motor it shut itself off. It's got a fail safe. Like the second it hit the rock wall, it shut itself off. Windshield wipers kept working. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm and surprised that, that thing didn't like automatically call nine one one. It may have. Like, I mean, I don't know. We we got that thing out pretty quick with the with the track oak. I got I got I got busy in there, but <laughs> <laughs> man, it was. Uh, that was entertaining. Like I, I've never had the phone call. Hey, um, do you want to just destroy shit? Like yeah. normally, I destroy shit, but it's like uh, after I break it, I'm like, I gotta fix this. Yeah, like, I gotta pay for this, or I gotta work on this, or somebody's gotta work on this. I feel bad for whoever's gotta work on it. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry, my mechanic sitting in the corner. He's not even listening. <laughs> <laughs> he's thinking about all the stuff he yeah. broke already. Yeah, he's he's exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, like normally, normally you're like, oh, man, when we get done, like we have to clean this up, whatever it may be. Like I made a mess, blew up a car, trashed a car, totaled a car and didn't have to worry about it. So it was <laughs> like every I mean, what more could you want? You just load it up on the <laughs> fire truck and go on about <laughs> load your day. it up and haul ass <laughs> like, hey, we're going. Want to go to the steakhouse? Now nah, let's get wings. There's a good-looking girl over there. All right, perfect. We'll pull in there. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> no, it looked like a, a good time, dude. I, I thought it was funny as hell. Because you see it on the story, and then you see the 514 on the side, and then you see it hitting a tabletop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what is going on down there? Yeah, it, it was uh, It was a perfect Monday activity. Like, Monday is, the, is, is usually the slowest and the busiest day all in one. Like, it's the day that the phone starts ringing. Yep. It, on the racing side of things, but you're not riding or anything. So they call like, what are you doing when or Monday? That's the perfect day. All right, sick. We'll be there. Yeah. So, um, no, it, it really, it, it was, it was, uh, it was a hell of a time. Plus you got home probably early from, uh, Georgia. I did. Not a far drive at all. I did. We made it back with them calling the last test. It made, we made it back. I was in the grocery store picking up my, wife's birthday dinner because i missed her birthday no big deal <laughs> racing you know she'll have another one next year exactly exactly i've been with her for like 14 years so like i i've made it to plenty of them i'm pretty sure i think <laughs> i don't know i've probably missed a couple anyway um oh absolutely a yingling yes sir <laughs> yeah no a b for this baby uh-uh you heard that heard it here first <laughs> Um, anyways, uh, yeah, so we were back at the grocery store at like four o'clock. The race was over at one. Worked out great. Race was over at 12. Podium was over at one. Dang. Yeah. It was that early. <laughs> it was an early day. It rolled right on through. Light on the transfer. Yeah. Light on the transfer. We still had, I mean, the first test was 10 miles. So like you look at a lot of national enduros now, you're looking at five and six mile test and, and yeah, there were some fives out there, but, um, I mean, we had we still had a full day of racing, like enough for Grant to still beat us by like fucking three minutes. So, <laughs> like, dude, yeah, he can really turn it on when he wants to, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it pisses me off so bad. I I saw the trophy this year and I was like, just put Grant's name on it. <laughs> and AG's like, oh, it, it ain't even started yet. Why would don't talk like that? You've already got yourself beat. And I said, Alan. He missed a test and lost a minute last year and still won by over a minute. Just put Grant's <laughs> name on the trophy. Be done with it. And he's like, oh, come on now. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> now just put his damn name on that trophy. Might as well. Dude, we were just a little bit farther north of y'all. and it, we It started raining like around lunchtime. But up there, I guess it started raining like second test, right? Yeah, so I was watching the radar and like I looked. I was like, I'm good till 11. So I, I I took my it was dusty, like dry yeah. dusty, powdery yeah. dusty. So I took my goggles, no gaskets, two tear offs, test two, test three, and I'm like, oh we're like we're good. No no reason. And it starts dumping on us. And it started raining in test one for a little bit. It started raining in test three, right as like Grant was lining up. Um so like Pro 2 and earlier Pro Rows had a little better clarity at the first. And, like, I'm just sitting there going, damn, why did I have to suck so bad last race? Like, I really <laughs> – that, that extra five minutes, like, really screwed me. So, test three, I'm like, ah, it, it goes in at – I think it was, like, 
eleven oh six is when when I took off, and I'm like, we we don't have rain coming on the radar till like eleven thirty. Like everything's good. I'm just gonna take the same dust goggles. Like it's we're getting a little bit of we're getting like ten minute showers, and uh, it started dumping, and then test four, it was, I mean a monsoon like when it <laughs> when it got bad it got bad and yeah. it was the same exact way like i want to say craig took off um maybe maybe around toth so like third fourth place so 37 it started coming down and like i've probably ridden in worse rain like raced in worse rain twice in my life like really? as far as the way that it came down for for a brief time not not the whole time and and I don't even know that it was the way the rain was coming down but how dark it got like I mean somebody hit the somebody hit the lights like yeah. and I come out the backside and I get done and I and I'm just drenched soaking wet get to the truck and Bubs is like man it really started raining at the end of that one I'm like at the end <laughs> I started in that and he's like He's like, oh, yeah, I mean, I, I had to pull a couple of tear-offs for the last mile. I'm like, I pulled two tear-offs before I got to the transponder. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was, I had my goggles off in turn four. So, yeah, that was, I mean, that was absolutely, it, it was a a brutal, brutal test. Like, with it being hard slick, and since people had already raced on it, like, it, you know, it, it kind of hard slicks it more. It takes, oh, yeah. What's that silty dust once yeah. it gets wet? And and that was the problem. Like the silt, the silt when it gets wet, like still has some traction you can look for. Since the race had already gone through, like the main line was beat down to a hard base and the silt was off the edges. And then the rain hit, like it was like glass. I mean, you were like trying to ride in fourth gear and still miss tight trees and just like hitting yeah. everything. So, and doing it blind. I mean, with, with, Rain coming down so hard, it didn't matter how low you looked; it was just right in your eyes. But um, we had. I you mean say to tell me you couldn't make up time on them in those conditions? Last year, <laughs> last year I was the man in those conditions. This year, I think I'm getting old and soft. Something <laughs> like that. No, man, I'm telling you, the way it worked out, it was like it. It started, and I might sound like a little bitch for saying this, but I swear it started like every time, like right around the time Toth took off. So like. Toth and back got it really bad, mm -hmm. and and I was like kind of in that group aside from Grant. Like Grant was just kind of gone, but like I was in the I was in that I was in the hunt for that group. But um, you know, it that extra three or four minutes, like that's hell. Three or four minutes in, my goggles were off. Like yeah. so, no, it, it it's uh it, it needed to start raining like five minutes sooner every time. I would have been okay with that if they would have put me in the last test, which was a gnarly test with the rain with those conditions. Those boys would Grant would not have gotten those checks. I can promise. Like, <laughs> I that's my test. That's the that's the AG special. It's tight. It's what I grew up riding as a kid. Like stupid tight. Like sometimes stop, take your feet off the pegs tight. That's what I wanted to see, and they called it before so I got to go in my test. Year over year, when they're going back to these same properties, they even keep the tests the same most of the time. Like you know, test six. I do, and it's not <coughs> test six. Last year was probably six miles. This year was ten. But so is it they, that the same they, section, or do they, they rotate they, them at all? They, sometimes they – it depends on the club. Sometimes they rotate. Sometimes they ride it backwards. Sometimes they ride – like, test one this year <coughs> was usually test four or five in years past or two on the way out. And depending on which direction, like, usually it goes one way or the other, counterclockwise, clockwise, year to year. Um <laughs> And it was almost always identical. This year, they took us on the main trail, like, where it was good, and then they would just dip us into some tight stuff occasionally. So um, this year was a bit different than than years past. Like, But you still know you know, kind of where you're going. No different than GNCC. I, I guess it is more different than GNCC. Like, GNCC is usually always the exact same course given – maybe a mile at the most yeah. forwards or backwards. So yeah. <laughs> like Enduros you can't remember you, you can't you cannot remember sixty miles of racing. So like it is gonna be more difficult, but like you still know what that's the test. Like, oh, this is the test with the ditches, this is the test with the open pines, this is the test that is gonna be muddy, it's got low line areas, whatever it may be. 
Um, so you, you just remember like the big things, but like the correct. general gist yeah. of them all. Or like Virginia, there's a uh, there's a rocky uphill. Um, the dragon's back. The dragon's back. So we always have this rocky uphill. You come to it, and usually the alternate's faster. This year I went for the alternate. I've never gone to the alternate. Alternate, but the alternate was faster in years past. And this year they ribbon off the faster part of it. So I'm like, <laughs> I dipped to the alternate because gotcha. I'd watched helmet cams. I remembered that section. I get there, I go right, and I'm like, shit, there's the tur- th- that's the turn up. Where are we going? Like yeah. they, so they did slow it down this year. Um, uh, Missouri, like the waterfall, like you kind of know, like if we go there, you got the waterfall in the last test. Like stay to the right for the majority down towards the end. It starts sweeping right, cuts across, and then you, you're on a solid slate of rock, and it looks like black loamy dirt, and you don't realize it. Like it looks like black dirt. Um, but it's not. I promise. Or is I it? learned a lot of these things the hard way. Like I, I learned that that was not black dirt the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> Two cedar trees, and I went straight into each of them. Like, oh no, could not get turned. I'm like trying to do the old bar wiggling. I'm bar wiggling, and it's not just straight. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it, <laughs> we're losing land. Like a lot of places are losing land, and then on top of that, I think we we've got um, the people that that are in charge. Like they kind of have their places picked like where they like to go and what they like to see. Um, I think that we have gone to some venues that I would like to see get a national every year, like Michigan, I think should get one every year. Doesn't make sense sometimes why we don't go back to some of those places, but, um, especially with the rig coming from Michigan. Yeah. 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 hundred percent. But I think like national enduros overall, like you get a better mix, you get, you get more weekends like this weekend where you saw a guy like Craig, who was who won the last one not able to compete this weekend the same level and that's the cool thing that I've seen in national enduros in years past like I've always been on the podium and it's like kind of a stretch of the imagination when you think back like how are, it, it's not timekeeping anymore you don't have to be smart with the clock like how can the same guy be good from <laughs> Wyoming to Michigan to Sumter to the 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 terrain's so different where GNCC Overall, the tracks are very similar. Mm-hmm. Like, I could run – I could say I could run the same suspension and the same tire and 90% of the GNCCs and be safe. We're a national enduro. It's like we're going to change our tire, hell, maybe midways. you got to know that the last section at Pennsylvania, you're going to need a gummy tire. Yeah. But the first section, you line up with a gummy, you're screwed. So – like the national enduros are cool for that aspect. Like you get a mix of everything, a lot, a lot of variety. Have you noticed any difference this year with new ownership coming in and like things changing a little bit, like adding stuff here and there? Like everyone kind of knows what went into it, but with the new ownership, have you noticed the difference? Like, because th- it's predominantly the clubs doing most of the work and laying out the trails, but I've noticed a couple things, like from the spectator standpoint, like some couple things different. So I I haven't been to one this year though. <sighs> I want to say that the the media is better um, on the social media. Um, I noticed that Shan Moore was not there this weekend, which sucks. Like um, I I know he's <coughs> he's always been big on articles for National Duro, so um, yeah, I, I noticed he wasn't there and like. National Enduro can never be televised. Like, it's just, I mean, you know, like it, (coughs) it's not something that could be televised, just would never work. Um, And yes, you could tear apart the roots and and change the foundation of that series and, and, and make it what it's not and televise it and make it a sprint Enduro and call it a National Enduro. But um, what a National Enduro is, the way it is, could never be televised. So it's hard to make it grow. Um, I think that they've got some things that they, they want to see change, but like overall it's the same series. Um, there's a lot of ideas. There's ideas that people have shared. There's ideas that I've shared. It usually falls on deaf ears. Um, we're not as smart as the other people. Um, you know, to me personally, like I don't have to fight for a row every week, but like to me personally, and I did see an email come out about this just recently. We actually did a vote on it. And I voted I in favor that. of this yeah. happening. Um, but it's something that I brought up because a sponsor of our team, who's a rider, who loves to race, who's a sponsor of your show, I believe, from Pittsburgh now. Okay, not anymore. Um, sorry. 
good thing I didn't name drop, you know. <laughs> it would sound like a sponsor. Um, but is a sponsor of our team. Brought up an idea. It was a good couple shows, but. Yeah, so <laughs> brought up an idea that he's like, dude, I race like three national enduros a year. But I would pay $1,000 at the beginning of the year to say that I got on row 41 every race. I don't want to be in the pros. I don't want to deal with you guys. Like, I don't want to get passed by you guys. I enjoy my race, and I don't want to get cleaned off the bike by any of you idiots. Yep. No offense and to you guys, but, like, that, I don't want that. For me, real quick, I don't want to try to get on row 41 and end up on row 148. Exactly. So, for him, he's like, I, <clears throat> I would commit to more races if I knew that I could get the row that I wanted. And if I could, at the beginning of the year, find a way. And he's like, why don't we do something like this? Like, I get you can't wipe out an entire row, but if you could buy two positions for each row, for each round, and then people that sign up, because National Enduro, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's low numbers that follow the entire series, which is cool and also tough. It's cool in the fact that they always have close to the same numbers, which means you're getting to see a lot of new faces every weekend. And it's usually people from the local series. You know, you go to Missouri, Missouri, you're going to see their local Enduro series. You go to Michigan, you see their local Enduro series. You know, you go around here, you see our local Enduro series that I grew up a part of, Citra. Shout out to those guys. They, they yeah. built me for tight trees. I want to see some more tight Enduro racing come back. So please, guys, stop using the skid steers and let's <laughs> do some machetes. Um, <coughs> but, no, um, like, it – when you when you see less than thirty percent of the the people following and attendance, like it makes sense. Like for those thirty percent, give them a good row. The guys that we've seen for years, and like I've been doing these things long enough. Like I know the familiar faces. You know, you see the 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 Mitch McCree. I'll just use him because I don't think he's missed one in in years. I mean, I grew up racing. He he was part of. He was president of Citra Youth at, at that time, and he never missed a national enduro. He doesn't want to be in that lottery. Like, he wants to go race his race and leave. He might want to be row one. He's driving back to Georgia every race. Like, pay a fee, and I guarantee that the series can make more money. So, like, things like that are ideas that we've discussed, and it's like every time I discuss it, everybody tells me the negatives. Like, man, stop with the negatives. Let's try it. Like, I'm not sitting here. I, I'm getting the same row anyway. What does yeah. it matter to me? Yeah. I'm a voice of the people. That's what I've always tried to be. And I'm an advocate for doing things the way that I see that it, I think it's right after hearing multiple opinions. And the way that things were run for years isn't the way that they need to be run tomorrow. And if that was the case, then, you know, they, they always they always talk about, oh, well, you can only change so much. Well, then why the hell did we drop timekeeping? You know, really? So when you look at a lot of these things, it's like, uh, I mean – I'm telling you, the, the ideas I've brought and the ideas that have been shut down immediately is like, it, it's pretty frustrating. But at the same time, I mean, I I know that they are trying to change some things. I think, uh, I think that that this year, like you see, you see a little more consistency. Um, but again, it's not all consistent consistent because you've got to understand <coughs> to go and lay out 80 miles in 10 different states i mean i i have to look at the back side of it every single time so it's like re really i think they're doing a great job I with can sit different here. crews in each e exactly state too. and i can sit here and i can complain about it and i've been i've been a part of the good side of things and a part of the bad side usually i'm on the bad side but um it i i've seen both sides and i've i've also promoted races so like I understand the complaints, especially coming from a pro rider. So they're, you know, whoever's listening to this right now is probably bitching that I'm saying something. But <clears throat> in all fairness, I do look at both sides, and I have promoted races. Hell, I've run enduros. I've been, I've been the the AMA guy that had to that had to go out and measure a line and protest a buddy of mine. Like I, I was, I was the guy that day that had to that, that had to fall. So I've I've seen all sides, and and I think that they could do better. I mean, just flat out. But you can also look at me and say, man, he could do better. So, yeah. you know, we can sit here and, and judge e each other all day. But I, I do think that for them to see growth, like what I think that series is worth, like to me, that is the best series 
to get people involved with. Like, if you go race a national enduro, and now it's getting more competitive, but like five years ago, you went to race a national enduro because you loved riding your dirt bike. And a lot of people there that raced probably only entered four or five events a year. Like, they went to ride with their buddies. And that's the way national enduros were. And to yeah. this day, <coughs> you go down through the pro pits, like, you will see all the pro riders communicating. You sit at a reset. You will see every single one of us talking shit, talking about, man, that log. I, I, Man, I hit that thing, took my front end out, hung my head off in the creek. I'm using trigger for an right now. But, um, yeah, like, I mean, the, that's the cool part about enduro racing. It's like it's very, very, very friendly. Like, it's it's just yep. a whole different style of racing. I mean, even, like, uh, like my buddies and I, like, racing Sumter, like, riding with, like, Dustin Simpson. and yeah. Brandon, Like, I can't keep up with him on a normal day to save my life anyway. So then you ride the same row. You're with a, an A-class buddy, a C-class buddy, a double-A buddy. And then you all ride to the same spot, sit there, hang out a little bit, and then keep and you going. all yeah, you get to talk for twenty minutes and say, "Man, I hit that, I hit that <clears throat> fucking pine tree right off the bat." Yeah, I saw it, or 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 which yeah. one? And and like it's it's crazy what your mind will actually remember, like like the the instant playback we get during racing. Like a, a day after the race, you don't remember any of it. Like mm -hmm. you can't remember the track. Like, but while you're in the heat, like, you can remember every tree that you crossed. Yeah. Like, you could talk about an angled route coming out of a right-hander around the two-mile marker, and I'm going to know oh, that right, route. Oh, right next to those two rocks? That Exa are... That's the one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, like, it's wild. Like, so that's the cool part. Like, that's the cool aspect about enduro racing versus anything else. Like, it really is. <clears throat> it really is enjoyable, and I think it can grow. I think it's uh, it's it's got a lot of potential. I think that the paddy cam has helped. Um, or I guess it's now the XC gear paddy cam, but <coughs> sorry, shout out one of the sponsors. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, I think that that, that side has helped it grow tremendously. And I, and I think that there's a lot of room still for that series to grow. And, and I think with the new owners, like, and we'll see before you get into the, the new owners, that what, like, I wasn't trying to nitpick it at all or talk about bad or good or whatever. I just want to know if it was different, like, different in, in any way. Like, a sign-up different? Is the trails different? Is the – it looks like the podiums are different, like, um, podiums the are way that they're different. presented. Yeah, they I mean, the, me the media – honestly, the media is different, which is what they, they – that's where they need <laughs> to make their push. Um, one of the big things that I've always said is, like, enduro is an old man sport, and it continues to get older which means it's a dying sport. Mm -hmm. So how do you make it better? You add youth racing. They're at, they've are at they added youth racing, but it from the outside looking in, it, <clears throat> I hope they stick with it. Because right now, good idea. it's, 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 <laughs> 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 next they might do e-mountain bike racing. Wouldn't that be neat? Wouldn't that be neat? Wow. Huh. Looks Some like of the races, thought of something like that. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, conversations that have happened. <laughs> um, any, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I like like when you look at the median age of 48, like, you know, it's a dying a, a dying breed. So, um, like, we, we see the youth racing taking place now, and I think that that will help, but I hope they stick with it. Like, it's probably losing money right now on the youth side. Um, but... It's got to build. It's got to get there, and and hopefully that'll get some younger kids into enduro clubs. Like I grew up as a part of enduro club, so when we had an off weekend, like the kids, the dads, everybody went out. The dads drank beer. The kids tried to sneak the beer, the whole nine yards, yeah. and and we went and cut trail on the weekend. So, um, you know that that was something that 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 is something that you see just vanished. And you look at the enduro club, like the one that I grew up in. And everybody's 70 years old. Like, they and don't no have one's replacing the, them. Yeah, they don't have the energy to go out and cut 80 miles of trail. Yeah. Like, and lay this out and talk to the government and, and try to get all the cops out there in the county involved and this and that. Like, there is a lot of work to put these events on. <clears throat> and that's where, like, you can't have one sanctioning body do all the work. Like, it, I understand. Like, you could never do that. So, it'll never be, it'll never be perfect. It'll never be flawless. But... Um, you know, I still see the flaws that could be repaired. Are the kids running on Saturdays? Or are they running on Sundays before? Saturdays. Okay. Yep, Saturdays. So they got to go out and man all the checks. And yep. yep. How many of those races are actually going on a road, though? Because that, 
th- for those that don't know, the reason why the kids couldn't run it before or most of the time is because you got to be able to Stay transfer highways, down yeah. roads. Yep. So, um, probably. Guess, so that's I think why they've cho- chosen the venues that they've chosen this year um, is to try to do the youth racing. So this weekend <coughs> we had two road transfers, and outside of that, the rest were on the same property owner or right there touching his property. So it, it it made sense to have a youth race there. Sumter, like, we had two road transfers outside of that. Everything was right there near the clubhouse um, on the sand roads that were owned by the state park. So all of that is able to be policed, and, and the kids can ride the transfers. Uh, <coughs> there will be races. Like, Indiana, I want to say we hit road every single time. I doubt they can have a kids enduro there. Um, have a kids hair scramble. They always do. But I, I don't – or a fun run, I think they call it. But I don't think you're going to see a, a kids enduro at some of these venues. It, it makes it more difficult. Um, but overall, like, there are places where you definitely can. <clears throat> and I think they're trying to move to where the majority of those are those rounds. Um, and, you know, give throwaways, make it to where somebody can win a, a national championship fairly easy to, to make it appealing to those people that want to make their travels and uh i'd love to see more kids do it like it is a really fun unique style of racing and you know even hell like if i'll probably if my kid decides to race dirt bikes which i hope he doesn't uh, <laughs> <laughs> my back won't be able to hold out for that but i i'm yeah. gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna at least try to keep riding with him but get a golf club know, in his hands dude i try <laughs> all he wants is bike 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 that's all i hear all day long we wake up in the morning. I wake him up, and he's like, Baba, bike, bike, <laughs> bike, <laughs> bike. I'm like, dude, if you say effing bike one more time, I, I don't, I'm going to strangle you. <laughs> like, we've got, we own seven bikes, and he's not to dirt bikes yet. God, I'll never be able to afford seven dirt bikes, but he sure thinks I can. So, <laughs> I mean, we have a bike at every house, every every place he stays, my aunt's house, my my grandma's house, the lake house, the RV, our house, like everywhere he is, there is a bike there and then he has his traveling bike. Like he's got a practice <laughs> bike and a race bike for every event. So, yeah. Um but no, that's a that would be a cool event like that he's that's where I see yeah, exactly 100%. Like he's got graphics and shit like um <laughs> I think he's already taken over 514. But it is cool to see, like, he, I mean, dude, he can pick me out in a video. Like, like yeah. he will, at, at at a year and a half, he could point and say, Dada. Like, he knew who I was coming through. So, like, stuff like that's cool to see. And, and, he, and he loves, absolutely loves bikes. I mean, I think a lot of say the same thing. Like, I'm sure Thad said it about Jacoby and Caleb said it about Crew. Like, man, I hope he does anything but. But they're hooked to it and, like, you see what you used to see in yourself through them. Like yep. you see the hunger that, that you used to have. And it's like, it, it, it to an extent kind of revamps you. Like you want it again, like, because they want it. Mm-hmm. And one day, hopefully he and I will ride national enduros. I'll still wax his ass. Cause I mean, <laughs> daddy's, daddy's the champ there, but um, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, 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 it's cool to see him grow up. And like, I, I will definitely push him towards the enduro side of things. Like, <clears throat> I think it's going to be, um, like that's the that that is what I picture like the perfect son and father race would be like go race a national enduro. Oh, 100 percent on the same row. Yeah. Or maybe I'll be behind him so I can show him the fast way through the tight trees. Yeah. <laughs> How'd I catch you already? <laughs> yeah. But, no, it's uh. I mean, the National Enduro is, like, to me, that that's home, and I, I want to see them succeed. Like, I really do. Do you see a way that there could ever be a time to where you get paid to run National Enduro <sighs> if your name's not Josh Toth? Dude, I, I – Which, I, shout out to Josh, man. He he worked out that program. I, I really wish that I could say yes. Like, um, <clears throat> for years, like, there were – 20 guys making a salary at GNCC and I've had this argument with with the promoters like oh there's just as much more there's more money there's more money now than ever in racing and I'm like bullshit bullshit there was 10 to 12 guys more money making, to be made they're saying I don't even know what they're saying like more money they're bringing in that yes more money that they're bringing correct but more money going out yeah where yeah yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> I just <laughs> meant like all. Of I don't them. even know. I don't even need to get it. I, I'm not gonna get started there. That that's a that's a rabbit hole that. No, I'm not even talking about one promoter in general. I'm talking about the industry in general. Uh, Oh, yeah, I I agree. Tire sponsors, gear sponsors, goggle sponsors, everybody. Yeah, and and it's it's one of those things, like, when when I see it, like, from my standpoint now, I saw, I saw, I lived it. You can ask the riders. There were 10 guys making a salary at National Enduro Plus. There were 15 to 20 at GNCC making a salary, making a living. There is not that anymore. And the guys who won National Enduros could not compete at GNCCs. Occasional podiums, like, all right, so Mike got a podium here, here and there. Like, he was a bad dude at Enduros, but he was trash at GNCCs. Like, now we are expected, like, you are expected. If you win GNCCs, you best be winning National Enduros. If you win National Enduros, you best be winning GNCCs. If you can't do both, like, or Sprint Enduro, or ISD, like, if you don't have a second, if you don't have a second series that you that you can compete at the top level, like, good luck getting a good salary. <clears throat> the best chance you got is at GNCC, mm-hmm. which is, love GNCC, but at the same time, I hate GNCC. Like, just brutal. <laughs> like, yeah. if I Three had hours it my way, long time. dude, if I had it my way, like, let's go National Enduro Race and let's pack our bags and leave tomorrow. Like, we're going to fish on Saturdays before the race. Like, it, it's it's laid back. It's cool. It's a chill environment. Like, it's it, it's a family affair. Like, it's it, it, GNCC's work. Like, you show up on Friday and it's work. All day Saturday, it's work. All day Sunday, it's work. Sunday night, I'm driving. It's work. I mean, for, for four days, it is it is relentless. It's sixteen hour days. And and National Enduro, it's like, man, I got a six hour race to look forward to with breaks. Like yeah. don't gotta pedal the yeah. track, can't <laughs> can't pedal the track. Like I mean, we like there's been a lot of times we've hunted or fished the day before a race. Like it's yeah. I mean it's it's fun and you get to do it in a different state. We get to fish in Michigan. We get to we get to go and see something we've never seen in, in Michigan. We get to see something we've never seen in Pennsylvania. Um like there's there's a lot of things that we've done, you know, get to go to Busty Hearts Place in PA and it's just like fun stuff that that we get to do <coughs> that you just don't see at GNCC. There's no time for it. <laughs> yeah. So and it feels like GNCC is a lot bigger of a spectacle. Like I feel like you're like forced to perform more, like forced to uh, not force. Force isn't the right. It's more of a, a spectacle. It's more like there's more eyes. There's more stuff going on. I, I guess. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it, and there is more <laughs> pressure. I feel like, like directly. Yeah, 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 definitely. Like, <coughs> and and it's because you know, like, if you don't perform there, like, good luck getting a ride doing something else. Like, only as far as East Coast racing goes, like, and and really as far as that goes, like, majority of the country, like. You make more money over here, so like you want to be the best, or in in motorsports in general, you want to be the best. You go to a GNCC, mm-hmm. and that's where it is. Like whether you're European or or what, like GNCC is kind of there. Even <coughs> West Coast guys, like talking to the Reardons, like Angus Reardon and Will Reardon and stuff. Like they came from Australia, obviously, and they were racing West Coast. And then when they made the transition to full time East Coast last year, um, I was kind of talking to them about it, and it's like, man, you you can't really make a living out on the West Coast. Like, if you want to make a living, there's our bow fishing call. Oh yeah, he wants to know where you are, T Shep. Hey man, answer it. Tell me he's on air. <laughs> Trevor, you're live on air. Cut the show, cut the show short. We're ready to fish. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got the boat it. in the water already. You heard it from the man himself. <laughs> hey, don't worry. We're getting on XC2 next. Okay. Yeah, it's about <laughs> to get interesting. Talk about so that should be quick. Yeah, that. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just a bunch of guys our age that are still competing, saying that they're men. <laughs> and everybody, every announcer wants to blow them like, "Oh man, this XC2 or Pro Two riders leading the overall," and it's like, <laughs> "Oh yeah, that's because we used it as a stepping stone and got out of there after two years." But whatever. <laughs> Oops, yeah, me neither. <laughs> I think I already did. Damn it. Well, here we go. Digging out of a hole again. I'm I'm ready to leave whenever he is. 
You got the boat in the water? We just put in. We didn't know where to go. All right. Well, you find the fish, and I'll, I'll be there when the fish are found. All right. We'll keep it in the water and try to do it anyway. All right. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll call you in a few minutes. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bring a small a small speaker. Do you got a small speaker? Yeah, I got a couple of them. Oh, you brought the speaker from the shop? Oh shit. Dialed. <laughs> hey, leave it leave it up to my guy here. He's ready. He's gotta have his music going. Yeah, he's probably listening to music right now. <laughs> <laughs> ready to go. Uh, um Well, it was a pretty subtle transition into the X C two talk. But you actually called me so Craig and I, Goober Gazer, we were on the show talking about it. <laughs> And uh, you called me Sunday while I was at the race and had some very strong opinions on it. And you kind of mentioned the bullet points there. But, uh, like, look, let's look back at this past weekend. Liam Draper won a test overall. And I was talking to Logan Densmore, and he was saying that he believes that's the first time a Pro 2 rider has won a test outright. And I can't think of another instance. Cool. I won a national at 15. Nah. Next point. I mean, I, honestly, that's that's the way that I look at these things. Like, yeah. like the whole point of these classes are feeder programs <clears throat> to be the best. And if you look back, motocross, supercross, European, GNCC, National Enduro, and, and, and prior to XC2 it was 250A, look back through the years. The fifth place guy always stayed there. The top, fo- the top four, come on. Like, let's see if you've got it. And, I mean, dude, when I came through XC2, it was a – it. I never wanted to be an XC2. I wanted to be an XC1. A lot of guys are coming over here to be an XC2 or racing to be an XC – oh, it's a pro class. And it's not I, – I can't just bash on the riders. Like, I have to. I have to look at the teams, too, because you look at guys like – Let's say Jordan Smith, guy, what, eight years ago, puts a 450 in fourth place in Monster Cup. You can't have a yangling in front of you? No free ads. Are you shitting me? <laughs> Dude, if it was a Bud Light, you would, you would drink it, wouldn't it? He would drink it, no doubt. Hey, it was covering up the logo and, like, perfectly in the shot. If it was my a check Bud from, Light, My check from it. Yingling ain't came through yet, so. If it was a Bud Light, <laughs> he'd be drinking it. It's all right. I changed my beer now, like hotcakes. Every every week I'm on a different beer. I'm not selling shit anymore. I <laughs> sold I sold the hell out of Anheuser-Busch, and, man, oh, I tell you what. You got their logo on your head right now, pretty much. No, I don't. I changed <laughs> that. It's got Coors Mountains on it. Come on. <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> so, like, to me, like, <clears throat> I never wanted to be there. Um, for long. Like, it's a stepping stone to get to where I wanted to be. And it's like, it, it, it would be like if you go to work at a car dealership and one day you want to manage it. But you were okay with being a salesman. And you stopped. And you're like, all right, I'm good. I'm happy. Yeah. Cool. I'm making a little are, bit of money selling there cars. Are people, there are people that that is for. Absolutely. And there is, there is, I'm not cutting down on those people. There's a lot of people out there that that's for. But when you're a dirt bike racer and all you've known your entire life is trying to become the best, you never want to be a car salesman. You want to manage that shit, and then three years after that, you're owning that shit. And if you're not owning it, you're partners. You are at the top of the food chain, and that's where you want to be. And I see a lot of guys that will look back and say, damn, I spent eight years in XC2. I was never the man. And then you look at somebody like Craig DeLong. <clears throat> he had an XC2 championship, but he was not the man in XC2. He never was. And right now, he is competitive in XC1. Because points he leader. Wants it. He's the points leader. So when we look at things like that, what the fuck are you doing in XC2? Like, really, what are you doing? Is this what you set out for in life, is to have an eight-person XC1 class? And to follow them in XC2 because you think your shot of making a bonus is better. But then beyond that, we've got live feed pumping up XC2 just as big as anything. Oh, man, they're leading overall. They're leading overall. Oh, cool. He's 28 years old, 26 years old. Come on. I was winning overalls at that age. I was, But I wasn't in the kids' class. I was 
leading overalls in the kids' class when I was a kid, when I was 17 years old, yeah. flat out. Like, that's that's my point. And then you've got guys like the the Honda crew, XC2 only. Like, really? You've got one of the most competitive motorcycles out there, and you can't highlight a 450? Really? That's how we want to come into GNCC. And that's how we want to not just come in. I can understand year one, year four, year five, where are we at? You want to be competitive in GNCC racing with a Pro 2 podium. Cool. With two guys that are three which guys. Team, which team did you say? I'm sorry. Honda. Yeah. So we got three, three, guys. three guys that are all mid-20s. Like, that, fuck, you put them in XC1, all three of those guys can compete with us. Like, I'm not cutting down on the riders. They took those rides because they had to. Because Honda doesn't want to push it. Because the next team and the next team and the next team down the line, like, they want to keep their little Pro 2 class happy. And it's cheap and it's easy to get into. You give them a little, a couple bucks. Well, just give them the same couple bucks and say, let's go to XC1. Let's go racing, boys. Like, line up. Liam Draper, Mike Witowski, Cody Barnes, Rui Barbosa, all the way. The, there's only a few guys that I would say in the XC2 that aren't able to compete with us in XC1. But those guys, like, come on. Like, Reardon, he's young. That's a class for him. Yes, he's fast. He's up there in the points. I get that. But he's young. That is his class. That is where he should be. And, and this sorry. is his second year over yeah. here. And, and, and I, I think he's 18 or 19. No, and, and, and same thing with, like, Lyndon. Like, like Lyndon, what was it, his second year when he won it? Third. Was it a third full? I th think. It was. I think so. I was thinking he came over for a little bit, came over, uh, and then and then raced a year. That was his second year. Like, And then this was his third year. Third full year, fourth year he would have raced GNCs. I, I don't know. I I would have to look it up. But like to yeah. me, like that's acceptable. <laughs> and he'll have to move out. Like that's like a, a normal transition. Yeah. And then uh, like, I mean, I like a lot of these guys are my buddies. I'll probably get text messages, and then they'll all talk shit behind my back and think that I won't hear it because they do that every single week. But the good thing is, <laughs> guess what? They all talking about me, so I don't really care. Obviously, obviously, it matters. And they're all listening and on they, the pipe and, podcast. And they are, that. and they all say that it doesn't matter. They all say it really doesn't matter to them, but it does. Or else they wouldn't sit around and talk shit about me every chance. Every chance they get a, to, they get in a group, and and the group settings, you think I don't hear about it, but one of you's always a snitch. So remember that. Um, <laughs> but no, it's. It, I mean, it, it's facts, and it's not the riders, and it's not you guys. I promise. It's. The teams want them there, and it's like the riders could push it, but the riders are taught by these teams and by these team owners and by the manufacturers. Like, you don't speak up. You don't be a Stu Baylor. Do not do that. Yeah. Don't do that. Like, that's the worst thing you could do. I get that he's making more money than all you guys, but don't do that. Don't do not do what that guy does. You get what please. you get. You don't throw fit. No. Yeah. Please do not speak up. Do not be against the grain. Absolutely. Who would want the life that I live with a paid-for house, an A-class RV, a 40-foot trailer, a brand-new truck, a Toyota that I can bash around? Like, no, you don't want that. You don't want to be successful in this sport. Listen to me. Make your $38,000 and race your dirt bike and break your neck for me. That's what they teach. It's facts. I'm sorry. It's facts. And a lot of these guys are stoked on that $38,000. And then they spend thousand dollars a month on nutrition, a thousand dollars a month on a trainer, and then, oh shit, over half their salary's gone. Wait, hold on, it gets better. And then they go to Florida for three months, and they spend a thousand dollars a month on their rental house, and and then they turn around and, oh shit, they broke their wrists, and then there goes ten thousand dollars. Their salary's gone. Buddy, go work at Bojangles, or let's go to XC One. Let's see if we can make some money. And it, it takes both sides, like. The teams need to go back to pushing XC1. The sport needs to go back to pushing XC1. The riders need to want to be in XC1 again. They want. They need to want to come up and shut me up. Instead of sitting around in circles and talking about me behind my back, they need to come and want to shut me up. Flat out. But how... It's weird that like we're in an era where you have to incentivize that. Like you have to give them a reason to come up. Because I'm I'm with you. Granted, I'll never be at any of those levels. So, but my opinion of that is 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 look at a Craig DeLong. Like you said, he was never the man. Like he was never unbeatable in XC2. 
and then he moved up and had a decent year last year. Well, his first race up, he got on the podium at XC1 yep. at, at Ironman. But then came up, had, like, ups and downs last year, found himself in the hunt for a championship. Granted, a lot of crap happened in between that. But then this there. year, yeah, he put himself in that. It's easy to say, oh, well, but this, this, and this happened. Well, it's like, well, you were there. If yeah. it was that easy, anyone no, I mean, could have been there. I mean, dude, I, I've been I've been the example of this, 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 and happening happening this year and i think that most people would argue that i was the fast i was the guy to beat like i think most of the team managers would sit there and say this is the guy to beat like if you're lining up that's the guy to beat this year but i'm the this this and this happening guy and craig is the guy that has kept it there like so he he is the guy he was an xc2 guy but i mean now you look at craig craig is the only person that's won multiple races this year and He's leading the points, and, I mean, he could go win on any weekend. Yeah. And I think had he stayed in XC2 even longer, had he not won that championship and stayed down there longer. He'd be battling but for for the 17-way tie that we've got in XC2 with yeah. 25-year-olds. Yeah. yeah, like he might be winning some XC1 he, yeah. he, or XC2 races. He might have became the guy that couldn't be beaten XC2. Or it could have been the same XC2 guy that he was. But or hell, I think maybe his career is over. But I think him moving up kind of invigorates you, and I think running in that front pack on the first couple laps is way different than running with XC2 in those first yeah. couple laps. And I just feel like you get smarter, you learn more race knowledge, you get to ride with, like, all you guys. And like you said, you get TV time, you get introduced on the, the live program, get your sponsor shouted out, you get a clear track. I just – I don't see – and I, I said this with Craig, so I don't want to repeat myself for the people that keep listening, but – if you're not in the heart of hearts knowing that you can win that XC2 championship, I think you should be an XC1. Yeah. Like if you're racing for if you're racing to be happy with a top five, you should be an XC1, getting better, getting faster, and getting to the point where even if you're fifth place in XC1, you still beat the XC2 leader. Well, let's talk about Sir Mumble a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. Uh, my client. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> so let's talk about Nelka for a second. So when we hired him, like the first thing I asked was like, what do you want, XC1 or XC2? And he's like, I don't know. Granted, I had all of these conversations with <laughs> Nelka last year saying the same exact thing yeah, to him. And, and, and he's like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, what do you want? And I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm like, do you think that you can compete in XC1? He's like, I mean, I rode those couple races. What do you think? And I was like, I think you're wasting your time in XC2. Like, personally, your best result's fourth. Or No, he got a podium at Snowshoe, right? Yeah, he got a podium at Snowshoe back when he was training with me, I think. Him and, him and Ryder were second and third. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so he got, outside of that, it was like fourth place twice a year. And this year, <coughs> Tiger Run passed that halfway point of the race he was in the lead group with me like rubbing tires with me yeah which is past the point of i'm bonking today yeah. like if you're past that point like that hour and a half is like where you're like all right we're gonna start sh sifting out we're gonna see who's really gonna fall apart hour and a half people start falling apart or about an hour mark really and then about the 230 and that's when people really fail so he didn't make it to that point yet but he was still in the lead group um, same thing, Cap, Camp Coker. He's in Coker the lead running group. There. He's right there. I mean, hell, he passed me, blew my damn doors off. Florida, he was checking <laughs> out. He just did it way too yeah. soon. <laughs> and, and you know, he f he was finding his own in XC1 and the best riders in the world, and he was a, at best, top five guy in XC2. And I see these guys, and I'm like, damn, like, I hate to cut on the same guys, but, like, that group that I named, like, I ride with them. They're friends of mine. So I'm not, like, I'm not bashing on them directly. Like, I know what they're capable of. They don't know what they're capable of. And the industry gives them no other place. But, again, it takes both sides. Like, they have to push for one thing while the industry supports that thing. <coughs> Zach Osborne should have never been hired to come here for XC2. Flat out. Like, dude, really? You're going to come here for XC, XC2? Well, one year of XC2 and then moving up to XC1. I mean. But took an XC1 guy's job, or 
I'm not saying Zaka did it, but as a result, <laughs> yeah, an XC1 guy ended up by himself and then just yeah. got second place two yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it 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 sucks to see like the industry would prefer to put money towards an XC2 rider than an XC1 guy that, like you said, got second place and like <coughs> winning national championship or or what I would classify like a sprinter to, to me. I know it's not on paper, but like it's a national championship. Like there's some bad dudes there. He's a fast son of a bitch. Nobody's nobody's beating him. If he's putting the work in, nobody's beating him overall right now in uh, a sprint enduro. Lane? Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, it takes his ride. Um, and that's what the Not industry... directly, because I don't want people to point fingers at Zacho. No, it's not Zacho's fault. That's that's the that, only and, thing and, and I'm and clear about. Yeah, yeah, no. I, I, and I'm not bashing Zacho at all. That's like, the only I part Zacco. I was getting across. Super, Zacho like, did not say, I no, want him gone. No, Zacho's a good dude. Like, 100%. I, I like Zacho. What I'm saying is, like, the team should not say, let's get two XC2 riders instead of an XC1. Like, to me, like, that's like saying, man, let's sign up on used tires today, and uh, I think I'm going to settle for fifth. Um, I just don't want to win today. Save the bike. Like, man, we can save a few bucks, and, and we don't have to change tires. Like, we're good. No, you don't say that. Like, and and I understand there are people that do. And for those people that listen, for those people that settle, there is a place that if you're happy where you are, that is fine. I'm not. Ar- I'm not going to argue with you. You can send me my DMs and say that I'm bashing on you, and I'm not. There are people of all walks of life. There are settlers, and there are people that are dirt bike racers at the top level. And none of us are settlers. We never got here because we settled. <coughs> these teams want us to settle. And a lot of these teams are run by guys who were the best. And it's like, why do you want to settle? Like, why don't you go back and grind the way that I did to pull sponsors together to make myself a salary that was higher than a factory team would pay? But why are the teams not doing that? Why the hell has a team not had Rocky Mountain? Why was I the guy to pull that? Like, I mean, make that make sense for me. Yeah. How has nobody else shopped that? How has nobody else promoted themselves and said, I'm going to put you at the top. I want to do this. Why has nobody got red line oil? Like, why has nobody gone and promoted themselves? Like, because they find themselves settling, and a lot of these teams are doing it, and they're doing it to the riders, and they're dragging the whole program down. The riders equally, though, cannot settle. Like, because the way that I see it, like, Man, if my ass is on my shoulders around my team, everybody, everybody under the tent is going to have their ass on their shoulders. If I'm in a good mood, if I'm in a good, uh, a good mood, guess what? Everybody's in a good mood. Mm-hmm. If I want to fucking win, guess what? Everybody under that tent wants to do. They want to win. And and it it doesn't just start with the team doing it. It starts with the riders. It it has to start with whoever's the hungriest. Yep. And I mean, to me, like, dude, XC2 is not hungry. Like, those boys are settling. Like, why did you work your entire life, spend every winter away from your family, spend every dime of your family's money to settle? But it's the same thing because they're just like what we've talked about before with holding out for bigger contracts, holding out for more race pay, holding out for all that stuff. If they can make a salary, be it enough or not enough, whatever it is, if they can get free motorcycles, free parts, and make some money to live, why would you get rid of that? And then I don't think, like, when you're talking about them settling, I don't think they're settling because I think a lot of them do think that they can go win that XC2 championship. And I think they are striving to be the best in XC2. Why is XC2 the the career class that they want to make a career in, though? Because I think, well, I was I was close last year. Veteran. If if X Y and Z didn't happen, then I could have won it last year. So maybe if this year if everything at, goes you're right, at a I lot can win of guys, it this year. Like, like right now, you look in the in, in the top of that group. You're looking at a lot of five plus year guys. Majority of them, really. Now, what is the average age of retirement aside from Josh Strang, his old ass? <laughs> <laughs> Love Strang. Just talking shit. What is the average age of retirement for a, a professional dirt bike racer off-road? 
31. Oh, 30. The only one that's retired in the re- – well, I guess there's been a few. But, yeah. 30, 31. You're not looking much past that. So, if you're at 25 and it takes two years to learn XC1, which it always does, you're giving yourself two to three years to, to win a championship there and then retire? Like – no. But uh, so you being on your side, especially <coughs> now, like putting together this team and, and doing all this and hiring riders, managing the team, all that, what is more lucrative to a business? Like, are is a team going to go higher? In, which one are they going to pay more for? An XC1 guy that's in the sixth place to tenth place range or an XC2 guy that's a top five if the world spins on the right axis could possibly contend for a championship? What would I pay more money for or what would – they pay more money for. What's the industry standard? Because camera now, shots. now podiums, granted. camera shots. So, so that is that is why they do. But we've had I've had this argument at at the pro riders meeting, face to face with everybody, in front of everybody, and there's not a soul that can't say I haven't. Take the camera off XC2. Take it off. Put us at ninety percent of that camera. Don't. Promote it the way that they do, and guess what? XC1 will start to thrive. I mean, it, it's it, it just to me like they have put too much on XC2. They highlight it too much. I would disagree with that. Like, I don't see any more XC2 stuff than I see XC1 stuff. Like, I see more XC1 stuff, but I mean, to your point too, I guess you do you see do you see eighty percent more of XC1? Mm-hmm. No. Well, on the live feeds. Yeah. All right. I'm going to ask but another a question. But is a wait, 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 wait. I'm going to ask a question real quick. You know anything about baseball? Just anything. You ever watched a game? Yeah. All right. I'm not a fan. All right. Don't care if you're a fan or not. I'm yeah. going to ask a simple question. Yeah. Do you ever see a minor league team? Or do you only see the majors? Unless you know somebody on a minor league team or you want to go watch the Crawl Dads because you want to drink some beer. They don't matter. Well, They're not on live TV to to promote on every ESPN channel. They're not in the seven the the seven rounds. I don't know enough about baseball to tell you any facts, but I can tell you that minor league does not come up in the same conversation as major league. Yep. And high was, school football does not correlate to college. College was, does not correlate to NFL and and whatever. What what is the the CFL like? You don't see CFL players like CFL players are not in the same place as NFL players with their salary, with social media, with their presence in the sport, with their sponsors, with anything. Yeah. They made it to CFL because they couldn't make it straight to NFL from college. Yep. But and I was going to bring up the baseball analogy earlier because also if you are a guy on a minor league team and you get the call up you're going to go sit on the bench for the Yankees before you're going to continue playing in for the Crawl Dads. 100%. Same thing with NASCAR, like the Bush Series. Oh, I don't know what they're called now, but uh, the Bush Series before, if you got a ride in the Cup Series, you ain't staying in the Bush Series. No. You're going up to the, the goal is to be one of those 43 cars in the Cup Series, not to be and and and, that, and that's my series. thoughts. And and if you look to all almost all of the guys that have won XC2 and competed in XC1 you're looking at four years max. A lot of them, three to three, roughly three for a long time. Um, Jason Thomas kind of screwed that for the rest of us. Like he changed the age. At, at one point, there was an age limit. It was a stepping stone class. And then the argument was, well, then I have no place to be. Where do you want me to race? Grow a set of nuts and race XC1. That's where you need to be. Like the majority of those people went back to A classes. <laughs> Or go to A class, I'll go to the vet class. I don't care. But not everybody is cut out of the same cloth. If you're not cut out of the same cloth, if you if you can't grind hard enough to make it an XC1, man, if you can't grind hard enough to make it an XC1 on bikes, God, go talk to some of the quad guys. If you want to feel good about yourself, like these guys, these guys are grinding to make a few bucks. And yeah. I mean – Washing cars on weekends. Like, on machines that cost twice the money. And, and, I mean, those those guys are really getting after it. Like, to, to make nothing, to make peanuts. Um, But, 
you know, it, it, it's like when I hear, when, when I see it, when I hear it, it's like, dude, I was an XC2 for three years. My brother was an XC2 for two years. He won his first year. He won his second year. He's out. Dad, three years. Caleb, three years. Like, you look at the guys that made it. You're like, learning year, winning year, back That's it up year, XC1. Like, and there's a lot of guys that, that there's guys that didn't win XC2 that did the same thing. Like, all right. <coughs> did Lane move up as a result of the age thing? Is that why he moved up? No. Or no. he just moved up? He moved up. He was ready to sack up. Like, some people just want to sack up. Some kids don't. <laughs> I mean, it was it, like, I think, uh, I think right now, like, we're, we're at a place where the, these guys, I say kids, but I mean, they're grown ass men just still living with their parents because they can't afford a house. Like, and they think that going out and, and living and playing dirt bikes is fun. Like, yeah. I'm not here See, to play dirt dude, bikes. This is my living. Growing up my whole life, <coughs> I'm, I wrestled my whole life, and so I'm really big on, like, mental and mindset and drive and what drives you, what motivates you, what gets you going. And I I really think that a lot of it could be, like, these XC2 guys, just like 250 guys that never really were anything in motocross, supercross, move up to 450s and start contending for championships. I think it could be the same thing, like we're seeing with Craig DeLong and stuff like that. Like, I think – if you're competing for that XC2 championship, it's such a competitive class with those top guys. And if you're not winning, you're not getting podiums, you're not getting top fives, it's easy to go to that race questioning yourself, questioning your ability. What's going to happen today? Why am I not going to get there today? Why am I going to get beat today? And I think if you move up to that XC1 class, you go in there with no reservations. Like, all right, I'm here to go see what I can do. Yeah. Be as fast as I can. And then it takes all the pressure off. It takes all the worry off. It takes all the self-doubt off. And then... Once you settle down and get back into that flow, figure out why you're riding dirt bikes to begin with, instead of second-guessing everything going into it, you're going to ride faster. And then yeah. once you start riding faster, you get more comfortable, then you're like, holy shit, I can compete with these guys. And then I think that's when that big step in the career could change. But if you stay down, I, I don't know. I, I guess that's just the way that I look at it and the, the way that I see it, but I'm not there. I've never been there. I mean, you know, and and I guess I can sit here and say, th say the same thing. It's the way that I see it. Like – and and everything that I've said, like, dude, this is a podcast. I'm here to talk. Yeah. And 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 I'm speaking my opinion. And you know, you can sit here and and ridicule me. Like I said, all these groups, the same kids are probably going to start a group chat tomorrow that bash on everything that I said because they're going to hear it secondhand and then go listen, already pissed off and and not hear the details, not hear the facts, and like. <coughs> Yeah, but that, at least you have a dog in the fight. I'm just a fat kid with a microphone that's yeah, never. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, but but and that like, but they're they're still gonna bash on me, and and I really don't care. Like that's the difference is, is they still care what I think, and they still care about me. I don't care about them. I care about me. <laughs> you do and care about them, or else you wouldn't be no, I, giving it, them this it, encouragement what, to move. What, up. You wouldn't I, care what they did. What waste I, your career? I care about. I care about the sport. I care about the ones that are my friends. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. But, like, the thing is, like, I don't care what they think. Like, at the end of the day, I've got an objective. I've got a goal, no matter what it is. And I think what what I'm getting at there is not to, to cut, say that I don't care about them. It's that I'm focused on me, and they're focused on my opinions. They're not focused on themselves. The reason that I moved up and I succeeded is because I was focused on me. The reason they got to where they are today is because they were focused on themselves. At some point, they started focusing on what the industry thinks and focusing on, okay, how can I make enough peanuts to to make peanut butter and jelly? Still going to live with mom and dad or find a way for free housing because we're not making enough money. But <laughs> like, how, like, I I I mean, uh, you look at you look at it and it's like, God, like, I just couldn't do it. Like, I would go work at as as a starting manager at Bojangles for $78,000 a year and not have to drive for four miles. <laughs> like, let's flip some chicken, baby. Yeah. And, 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 you know, like, you look at these guys and the way that they got to where they are, and, like, there's not one that doesn't have an impressive background. Like, I don't care who it is. Jesse Ansley, Mike Witowski, Cody Barnes, Liam Draper. You go down the list, anybody in XC2 right now, they have a badass story. Like, you cannot discredit that. They have a story that 
that belittles any small town kid you know, any big town kid you know, and any person outside of this sport that you know. And it's like, yeah. damn, like and that besides, was a bad son of a bitch. Yeah. And <clears throat> you mean to tell me this kid's living in a sprinter van because he can't before nor like yeah. No. And like, besides 25 to 30 people in the world listening to this right now, they're faster than you. They're faster <laughs> than everyone you know. They're faster than everyone at your local track. Yeah. I mean, they're bad <clears throat> dudes. So, like, you, I can't discredit that. Like, that's what upsets me. And it's not it's not, it's not, not so much their mentality. It's not so much all the other things. It's, it's that they got lost along the way. Like, they lost the clear sight of an objective of who they were. And a lot of these kids, I think, like, I, I think that it's more of an identity crisis when you get here. Like, I was always the bad dude. I was that guy. I was the bad son of a bitch that won everything, all the way through youth, through nationals, everything I did. And then I get here, and I'm not the bad dude anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to my left. I'm looking to my right. There's a bunch of bad dudes. You start to question it. And then the industry tells you to really question it. You're not going to make XC1. Let's keep you in XC2 a couple more years. Yeah. Let's make some money. You can make more money to do this. And and then you start seeing that, and you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I'm going to settle. And it all starts with that that identity crisis where they forgot that they're the bad dude. They had a mission that they started out, and now their mission has changed from making it to XC1 and being the best rider in the world to let's see if we can win XC2. Yeah. Let's or, just see. or how long can we keep this thing going? <laughs> yeah, let's 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 drag it out until the bitter the bitter end. And now we're thirty years old, and we have no job experience in the real world, and we're starting over lives. And you can't go to a car dealership and work your way up. And a lot of these kids, like you look at them, like they're motivated individuals. Man, you put them selling used cars today. Three years from now, them sons of bitches are going to be owning a dealership. Like they're smart. They're they. They are self-educated people, and, and a lot of them, like, hell, they may not have gone to school, but they they went to the school of hard knocks. Yeah. And they and they know that they can push themselves and make money. Look at, an, uh, look at most of them, like, about 50% of guys who, hell, didn't even have to go to school have made something in this industry from motocross to supercross. Like, they, they have promoted themselves and found ways. Now, there's still other ones that fall off, but a lot of these guys, like, they want to be the best. Yep. Sell used cars tomorrow. Put, put half those. Hell, Jesse Ansley, the way he can talk, you put him in, in a used car lot. That son of a bitch will be a millionaire. In two years. No, he won't. For the sake of this argument and that example, kids, do not go work at a car dealership. Don't even start. Don't be a car <laughs> salesman. Go sell anything in the world. <laughs> I spent like seven years in the car business. Don't go in the car business. But I understand the, <laughs> the, the example. I'm just saying, like, and like Jesse put him Ansley, in an industry. He's a guy that that I've kind of talked about on here. Jesse Ansley. Say what you will about him, his results, whatever. He started doing the YouTube channels, and I know that we've talked about it a, a good bit. And, like, he's not going to be the number one video on YouTube, no. But people do watch and people do see it, and he has built, like, his own little community. Yeah. Doing what he does at the race. I've been with Jesse and seen kids come up asking for autographs and asking for pictures. And, yeah. like, f for where he's finishing at, there's no other guys that are doing that. And it just goes to show – Everything that you've done to build the brand and to yeah. build the marketability in yourself, Jesse's doing that. He's and hustling, man. Yeah. He's hustling. That's a guy. I mean, that's a guy that wants it. And like, he's he's one of those like, he's at that bubble. Like, what's he gonna do the next couple of years? Yeah, you're gonna go get a job. You're gonna move to XC1 and just see what it's like. Like, and fuck, I think he better give a stab at XC1. Just get up there and run with it. Why I mean, not? You practice with a guy like that, and it's like, damn, he's my speed. What separates us? Yeah, it's up here. Like yep. it's up there, hundred percent. And same thing. Like I always wonder too. Like there's there's guys that I know, and may or may not have talked to him on the phone during this interview. But like you take some people and take them to their local race where they've been the boss and they've been the king. They'll go outrun anybody. Yeah. No matter what GNCC guy shows up. If they come to your turf at your local event, dude, I was that kid. They're gonna I can win. Remember that? Like I, I remember running with Mullins and Strang and 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 Wibley at local races, and then getting almost lapped by them on the next weekend at a GNCC. Like, yeah, I, I know that guy. I was that guy. I've been there. How do you bring that mentality? Like Jonathan Johnson, I'd put my money on Jonathan against most people in the world at a mid east race. Oh, damn right. And before that, Bollinger. Bollinger was king, maybe. Yeah, that's what. King of Morganton. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, it, it's like 
I don't know how to make how, that correlate. How do you bottle that? I, I think it's just got to – like, it's got to click one day, and you got to know that you're that guy and you're hit. Like, you got to know that you're lining up the same mentality that you lined up at that Mideast. I don't need to walk this track. I'm winning. Oh, he walked it? Cool. Who cares? Yeah. Like, man, these guys line up, and, and it's like you can't get an advantage on them because there is nothing to gain because they know there's nothing to gain. Like, they are the best. And when I line up at a GNCC, like, if I've got doubts, like, I'm not the best that day. I got to line up knowing I'm the best. Yeah. I keep my head down. Like, when I put my helmet on, the, the bullshit stew stops. Like, I, I've, I, I, I know that I've got the most to gain. I know I've got that. And you can't tell me otherwise. doesn't matter if I do or not. Like, I've got the most to gain. I'm the, I'm the closest one to gaining it. It doesn't yeah. matter whether I can or not. That's my mentality. That's how it has to be. And if I don't have that, then I'm broken before the race starts. Mm -hmm. And I promise I don't go into a race broken. Yeah. Like, just doesn't happen. Doesn't matter if I'm 10th place riding around in the back of the pack. You won't break me. You can't break me. And at that level, that's how you got to be. Yeah. If you're going to yeah. make a living. 100%. And you got to shake it off. Like, we're not worried about last week's results. This week's a new week. Yeah. No, well, no matter. I want to I want to get into that too, but just real quick to to close out the XC two thing, and then um, but but just like looking at it, we're talking best case scenario. We're talking about an XC two guy moves up, finds out he can run with XC one, maybe win XC one. We're talking best case scenario. What well, I mean at the end of the day, there's people that can't get to that level, that won't get to that level, that are just faster than. Most every human, but not fast enough to compete top three, top five in XC1. What do you think would be the longevity of a person riding around in the back of XC1 versus a guy riding around in the front of XC2? Like if someone hears this conversation and they want to move up, but they haven't won an XC2 championship, one of those guys in that pool that you mentioned, if they move up into XC1 and they never break into that top five, would they make a longer career? Would they be able to squeeze the money out of this sport and do what they love for longer in XC1 at the back or staying in XC2 in the front? XC2 in the front. So that goes against everything that we talked about. And it's, not, it's not because it, it goes back to what the industry wants. It goes back to those team managers. It goes back to who's put, taking the pictures. It goes back to the live feed. It goes back to the people promoting XC2. At the front. So why would they move up other than <coughs> they just got to want it? Because the same way that anything starts, you have to start it. Yeah. <laughs> Flat out. Like, I mean, I can't say it, 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 it as dumb as that sounds. Like, it to me, like, you got so many guys that it's like they're scared to take that leap of faith. But what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? Is that where you want to be? I mean, that's the questions I got to ask myself. Like, is this where I want to be today? Hell no. The answer is always no. If you're that type of person, then the answer is always no. And the next question, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to stay in the fighting for XC2 and maybe get a podium in a year? And hell, that same day, would you have maybe got a podium in XC1? And if you would have maybe got that podium or maybe led XC1 for a lap, would you get more camera time? Would you potentially be a guy that maybe would get on a better bike and maybe could make a better career for themselves instead of sitting here watching on the pipe podcast at 10 o'clock at night <laughs> at 26 years old thinking about it? Maybe. The bonuses are going to be better if you can. Hypothetically speaking. Yeah. That's my that's my thoughts. No, and, and like you said, I think we both laid out, like, there's a lot of reasons to stay, but it's one of those things, uh, kind of the, the like the position I'm in, and I hate to relate it back to me, but, I mean, I could go get a job next week and be making X amount of money that's really good money. Would you be happy with it? But that's what I'm getting. So doing going down this road that I'm on, the ceiling is much higher. So mm -hmm. it's not as good right now as what I could go get at a job, but the ceiling is much higher. Do and you, it's kind of like what you you're talking about your right decision? now. No. Okay. Not for a People minute. ask me, like I've I've had I've had guys from Yamaha ask, 
do you regret your decision? You mean, would I reg regret my decision to take on three times the workload, five times the headache, and sacrifice results to make sure that other work got done? That almost sounds stupid. Like, you would automatically say, yeah, he's going to say yes. Fuck, no. No. The ceiling's higher. Yeah. I want this. Yeah. XC1, the ceiling's higher. I want this. Like, that's the mentality you got to have. Yeah. Like, you got to line up every day saying, no, I'm going to I'm gonna sit in bed this morning, and the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make these parts orders. And I'm going to sit here for the next four hours studying this damn parts catalog and make these parts orders just for them to turn around and say that the parts aren't in. And then you're going to turn around the, the rest of the day, and you're going to start packing. You're going to start doing the things that, that – that another team would be doing for you. But you're going to take on that load because the ceiling is higher, because it's something that you wanted to do. You have ownership in it. <sighs> Same thing from XC2 to XC1. Yeah. Like, flat out. Do you want it? Do you regret it? Yeah, there's going to be days where you almost think you wanted to regret it. No, I want it. This is where I want it to be. Yep. It's my answer. It's easy. That being said, it would be cool to see, like, some type of point out method or something like to make people Anything. move up at some point there was an age one they took that away yeah. anything that made it interesting take it out yeah <laughs> but I, yeah because there's no incentive to move up especially no. now that you took the top 10 xc1 pay away and they only pay for top 15 so whether you finish 14th on a 250 or a 450 you get paid the same yeah and um so like it took away the incentive so there needs to be i feel like there needs to be a way to like force people up uh or to point out or to move up i know we got to go I know there's a boat in the water in Morganton waiting for us, but I would be remiss to have you in here and asking. You just talked about ordering the parts, being the team manager, checking on Nelco, checking on Bubs, checking on Ty, doing all this stuff behind the scenes. From a person on the outside, like looking in, I think it'd be easy to point the feeling or point the finger like, hey, in this role that you're taking on, not having that team, having to do more of that, kind of correlating with your results this season. And – like I said, from an outside perspective, no one knows what goes on behind the scenes. But from an outside perspective, they're not sitting across the desk from you. So I did want to just ask, like, about your season and how how it's going this year. And like you said, you kind of alluded to getting into some of the team stuff. Has that been – I know it's rewarding, and I know you're learning a lot doing it, but has that been a distraction from riding at all? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But I'm <clears> – <throat> you know, to me – and, and I'm not saying I don't want an XC1 championship. Like, that's not – don't take that away. <sighs> to me, I've got a life after racing. But I want it to be involved with racing. So, um, for me, it – I can be distracted and know that at the end of the day, I'm trying to start something that will hopefully be there in the future. So, yes, it's distracting. Yes, I think that it – affects my results it definitely keeps me up at night um and i think that there's definitely benefits to just settling but i'm not the guy that settles i'm i'm looking big picture i've got a plan in place i've accomplished what i set out to accomplish with racing um i really have i've you know the the there's some goals that i would like to obtain like i'd love to win that gncc championship but like 50 years from now, I can sit back and say, man, I've won five national pro championships at National Enduros. I've won two OMA championships. We've won two world championships. I was top five overall at the ISD in the world on a discipline that I don't even race. Like, I've, I've, I've done, when I look back through my career at where I am now, I, I've really done what I wanted to do. So, if it affects my results today to start this team today, then I'm fine with it. Um, because right now, it's a lot easier to get sponsors when I'm still Stu Baylor. Um, and I had this conversation with somebody earlier today. They're like, man, you should spread out that workload. Like, have somebody else be doing that stuff. The thing is, when and they're like, uh, you'll – there will be a day where you can be Randy Hawkins. I said, go ask your kid who Randy Hawkins is. Mm. Go ask a sponsor who Randy Hawkins is. Was. Dang. 
and this is nothing personal against Randy. I was a big Randy fan. Man, the dude's bad. Yeah. Two wins, like, bad son of a bitch. But for Randy to go out now and talk to a sponsor, he's Randy Hawkins, the team manager. Yep. It's going to be much more difficult for me as a retired racer to start a team than for me, the active racer, to start a team. Because people right now, it's relevant. Because most of media specialists and marketing managers in this industry are what age do you think? They're definitely not old because guess what runs marketing right now? Social media. Oh, yeah. And anybody over 35, they don't know everything, the ins and outs of social media. So the people that pay are 30 or less, usually. So the people that I'm going after are people my age. They know who I am. They, they, they know who I am today. Now, 15 years from now, if I retire, I want to start a team. Guess what? It's still 30-year-olds because they're going to be the ones up to date in social media. Mm-hmm. I call this social media guy. I'm like, hey, uh, yeah, this is Stuart Baylor. And they're like, who? Stuart who? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's cool. Let me uh, – I'm going to shoot you an email. I think I think we heard of you one time. Yeah. Um, oh, they're inducting you into the AMA Hall of Fame. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> like – no, that'll never happen. They hate me over there. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it, it's uh, it, it, it's like, to me, like I'm trying to build something for for tomorrow. So like, after after a long answer to your question, like, yes, it interferes. Do I regret it? Absolutely not. Um, do I think it affects my results and mentality on some of the weekends? Absolutely. I'm uh. <clears throat> I try not to micromanage. I try not to tell any anybody anything what to do. Like I want to stay out of it, but it's definitely difficult at times. And um, and I want things done right. Like I, I as as much as it doesn't look like it from the outside in, I definitely am a perfectionist when it comes to racing. And I want things done the right way. And this year's been difficult. Parts availability has been tough. And just trying to make everything come together has definitely been a task in its own. And luckily, our team is is very easy to work with. Um, you know, as far as Ty, Bubs, Ben, like. Um, those guys, uh, they, those guys have never really been on a factory team. So luckily they don't know what it's like, or they'd probably be upset with me right now. So, uh, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, it, like I said, things are, things, th- things have been trickling in, but, um, you know, we've got some really great companies behind us and, and I got to choose those companies. So that's, what's really cool about it. Thanks. You ready to go shoot some shit? I guess so. All right. It's about that it. time. Um. Yeah. Sorry, it kept you a little bit longer, but we just got right into the conversation. Yeah. That, as always. X E T dude. They're all gonna hate me, <laughs> and it's live. I can't retract it. Oh shit! They're already talking. The group message is already. How many started. text messages have you got? Ah, just Trevor. Where are you, fish? <laughs> where are you at? Drop pin. Literally, phones vibrating as we speak. All right. Fish are dying now. All right, well, let's get out of here, man. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by, man. First one that, that took me up on – actually, well oh, no. – Ben ca- – Mumble – Sir Mumble came yeah, by. Yeah, but his his was more targeted. Like, we had planned it. You, yeah. You were the first, like, hey, I'm passing by. Let's yeah, do a show. Perfect. So I mean, no. dude, Strang lives right down the street. You can't get him to come by here. Dude, he was supposed to be the first one. Are you kidding me? Dude. I'd like to say he's the next one, but who knows. <laughs> we're actually just talking about it today. <laughs> you, listen, he's getting so he's old. He's 30 just, minutes from here. Just give him – I don't know, trade him off like, what do guys at that age need? Like Viagra or something. <laughs> hey, I got a, got a bottle of Viagra with your name on it, old old man. Yeah, no, we need to get him in here. But, yeah, I mean, dude, we're, what, a half mile off the exit? Dude, it's perfect. It's, it's a good location. Hell, he's, he's in, driven by out. here 15 times this year. Yeah. Guaranteed. So, Guaranteed. But, no, man, thank you for stopping by. I appreciate it. Uh, good conversation, as always. Uh, with, like I said, we were on a, on a roll We before. bashed it. There's going to be some – hurt feelings they are gonna have a sellout at target of tampax <laughs> tomorrow i promise the dirt bike racers will be in there heavy most of xe2 perfect <laughs> hey i, I mean uh, you have opinions on everything and some people love it some people hate it but that's better than being wishy-washy and being right in the middle like Man. people that's what that, that's what we're missing in this world take a stance Argue your stance. Stay on that stance. Don't play both sides or, like, don't be wishy-washy in the middle. And like it or not, you have a strong opinion. And, I mean, that's to be respected. 
Absolutely. I wish I would have started drinking before this episode. <laughs> <laughs> it could have got – I'm just glad you didn't. Man, if you would have had like a bottle of Crown when I sat down <laughs> and then asked me about XC2 – uh, I, I don't have ha- I, I don't have, have Canadian. I liquor. wouldn't have any friends. I wouldn't have any friends tomorrow. <laughs> All right, well let's get out of here, shoot some fish. Uh, thanks again for coming, man. I I really do appreciate it. It was uh, cool to have you stop by and uh, good conversation.